Wow, here we are, folks. <clears throat> Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. I'm reading a message by Dr. Malone. Tom Malone. Great, great orator. Great preacher. Great man of God. One who knew the Word and knew how to dissect it and had, had the power of God on him when he preached. Great messages he preached. And this one here was on the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And of course it's using the articles from the Bible. And it said, Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, who in the beginning, uh, in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Wow. And being found in the fashion as a man, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, 5 and 8. As a man coming on the earth in a fleshly body, the fleshly body must die. It is going to die. And that is it in a nutshell. The thing about it is Jesus knew the hour and the day when he was going to die at 33 years old. And he knew how he was going to die. He knew the end from the beginning. And he knew it was going to be a choice that he would make. That he would go and hang on the cross. That he would have all the sin of the world carried on him. And it would be the darkest hour in the world. There were three hours of super darkness. Can you imagine? No stars. No nothing. For three hours of darkness. As he took the sin of the world upon him. How much sin that must have been. To come like a swarm of bees. And just penetrate. Penetrate. And penetrate. And penetrate. Three hours and he's praying. Will there never be an end? Will there never be an end? Will there never be an end? In the flesh. He's taking this for you and I. He is suffering. The, taking the sin debt upon himself for you and I. That we may see that in the form of God. Humbled himself. And, and, and uh, Brother, brother uh, 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 Malone says here, I would like to speak, he says, of the incarnation of Christ. The subject is, Jesus is in the likeness of man, or why Jesus became a man. There are two phrases in the passage that I call to your attention. Philippians 2.7 and eight, have these two expressions, made in the likeness of man, and being found in the fashion as a man, and that is the subject. That's the subject now, why Jesus became man. Some may want to distinguish between the virgin birth of Jesus and the incarnation of Jesus. In a sense, this is a difference, yet the two subjects are closely related. The virgin birth involves uh, that miraculous act of God whereby the Lord Jesus was conceived without a man in the body of a pure virgin, named Mary. Incarnation is a divine act of God when Jesus was manifest in human flesh. Many passages speak of the virgin birth in Matthew 1, 18 through 20, says, Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Mark that down in your book. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. 
But while he thought on these things, listen to this. Behold, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, appeared unto him in a dream. This is Jesus himself appearing to Joseph. And saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That's the third part of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Other passages such as those in our text deal specifically with the incarnation of Christ. John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten Son, the only begotten, excuse me, of the Father, full of grace and truth. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, wow, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Wow. Those four or five things right there uh, prove that he was who he said he was. If one attacks the virgin breath of our Lord, he also attacks the incarnation of Jesus. In recent years, especially, there has been infidels against the virgin birth and incarnation of Jesus. For instance, there are some who say that the word virgin, as found in the English translation of the Bible, does not necessarily mean a chaste, pure young woman. Which uh, uh, some contend that the Hebrew word Alma does not mean virgin, but young woman. This is any kind of young woman. This is not true. Let us examine Isaiah 7.14, which says, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The word virgin here definitely means a pure, chaste woman who has not known man. This is the meaning of Genesis twenty four forty three, when Rebekah is called a virgin. This is the meaning in Proverbs 30 and 19, and also Psalm 68 and 25, Matthew 1 and 23. God quotes Isaiah 7 and 14 in the Greek New Testament, saying, Virgin. The birth mentioned in Isaiah 7 14 was to be a miraculous sign to the house of David and to all the world. How could a natural birth of a baby boy be special sign? Has not this happened millions of times? No. In order to be a sign, it must be a birth by a virgin who has not known a man. Wow. There are three general names of Jesus many, many times in the Bible. For instance, you find Jesus spoke of as the Son of David, and as the Son of God, and as the Son of Man. In three different places. The Son of David is his Jewish name. His uh, racial name. All of us know that nearly every book in the Bible was written by a Jew. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, the family of David. He was a Jew. Let's clarify that. Jesus was a Jew. That's it. <coughs> All right. Then there is the Son of God. This is his divine name. But there is another name. <coughs> I wonder if we study it as much as we ought to. Jesus is called the Son of Man. Eighty times in the Word of God, 
Jesus Christ is spoken of as the Son of Man. We'll look at some of the verses where Jesus is spoken of as the Son of Man in a, a minute. But what I want you to think of uh, is Jesus Christ as a man. Jesus Christ, a human body. Yes, a body just like you, a body just like me, and my body. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was divine. But Jesus had a human body. Now, many other things let's take a look at. Times in the Bible is called a man. The son of man is called a man. He was called a human being. We read, for instance, in Hebrews 2.14, For as much then as ye children be partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Now here, in the word of God, is plainly and simply declares that Jesus Christ took part of the flesh and blood. Do not forget that. That's important. I believe that the humanity of Jesus of vast importance. I've heard great scholars, great Bible teachers, say that the humanity of Christ needed to be emphasized in our preaching and teaching, just as the deity of Christ. Now, Tom Malone, uh, I, as I told you, is was was and is is probably and I I don't expect he's still alive, but was one of the foremost Bible scholars of his time. And now many times in the Bible, Jesus is called man. All right, now we're going to see the woman at the well who got gloriously saved went back under the city and said, A man, which told me all things that I ever did. Boy, and that was the, emphasized the deity of Jesus Christ right there, 4 and 29. When she viewed Jesus sitting on the well, there is a, there in Samaria, she looked on him and recognized God to be in the form of a man. Jesus spoke of himself as having flesh and blood on many occasions. In John 6, 53 and 54, Jesus said, Except ye eat the, my, the flesh of the Son of Man and drink the blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Now Jesus claimed that he was a man Jesus claimed that he had flesh and blood. Many, many times in connection with all the great things that he did, Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. Hey, when he was talking to Nicodemus that night in John chapter 3, he said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verses 14 and 15, when Jesus talked of Calvary, redemption, the cross, and, and the shedding of his blood for salvation of the world, he referred to himself as the Son of Man. Notice it again in Luke 19.10. He had just saved uh, Zacharias and the people wondered that he was such a wonderful friend of sinners Jesus said for the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost Luke 19.10 so we see his humanity connected with his divine purpose in the coming into the world hey notice again that Jesus spoke of himself as the son of man when he spoke of the resurrection. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in a whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew twelve forty. Yeah, you notice that Jonah went in a man, he came out a man. Notice also 
when Jesus spoke of the second coming, he spoke of himself as being the son of man. But as the days were uh, nowhere, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in such an hour as ye think, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 34 through 44. And uh, he said, know it now, when the days are like they are now, right now, wickedness. Uh, Lest you think that I am emphasizing something that Jesus did not emphasize. Lest you think that this preacher is emphasizing something in the Word of God does not emphasize. Let me tell you, no less than 80 times Jesus Christ was referred to in the Bible as a Son of Man. Son of God, yes. But the Son of Man, just as surely and distinctively, so the Bible declares... Now you say, why is that important? I want to give you, in a moment, five Bible reasons why it is important for Jesus to become a man to be our Savior. You think of humanity, of Jesus, and what it means to us as believers. I think of the story of a certain little girl. It was said that one stormy night, a little girl in her bedroom began to cry. She was afraid. Thunder, lightning, wind, and rain. Her mother went up and tried to comfort her. Now, honey, you are not alone. You know God is in our hearts and in our home, mother said. And the Lord is with you. When, uh, 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 uh continued to weep. Finally, the mother went back to the bed and the little girl said, I know the Lord is with me, but mother, I want somebody with skin on. In other words, she was saying, I want someone I can feel and touch, someone I can see, that my friend is exactly what Jesus did. He came. Listen, I was privileged and still am privileged. Don't know if I could find it. In my repertoire of great preachers, I have a case that has great preachers preaching on tape back from the 70s. And Tom Malone's one. I, I, I may be mistaken, but I don't think so. I believe I heard this message in person. Visible. from He humbled himself and lived on earth in the fashion of a man. You say to me, why was it necessary for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the member of the Trinity, from the very beginning, uh, the pre-existent, uh, the eternal existing Son of God, why must he come to a man? I believe there are five great Bible reasons. And he's going to tell us these. He became a man that he might subject himself to the limitations of a human body. My friend, we have some limitations the angels don't have. We can't at any time just go ahead and pop up and fly away. We can't do that. But First, he subjected himself to a childlike obedience to his parents. You just think of that little baby born in a manger that night. That little baby snuggled in his mother's arms. That little baby nursing from his mother's breast. That little baby crying about, carried about, excuse me, taken care of and cleansed. And that little baby in the human form, Almighty God, see him at the age of 12, as he recorded in the book of Luke, <clears throat> when his parents journeyed uh, homeward, they missed him and came back to the temple and found him. And he said, What, know ye not, that I must be about my father's business? Then they went their way home, and you read this story of Jesus 12 years of age, the blessed Son of God, and a, a little boy. Um, 
And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, Luke 2 and 51. Jesus Christ subjected himself to childlike obedience. He minded his parents. He honored his mother and father. He subjected himself to all the limitations of human body. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus knew what it was to be subject to fatigue. The Son of God, who made all things that I made, yet became tired. That body became worn and tired with many long hours of labor. I read a beautiful thing in Mark 4. One day, amidst a storm, Jesus was on the boat. The storm was arising. Disciples came, and we read in Mark 4.38 that Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillar. And they awake him. And the Son of God got so tired from toiling and laboring and ministering, speaking, loving, and weeping, over people that his body became worn out. He became tired and sleepy. So he lay on the deck of the vessel on a barred pillar and he had to be awakened even in the midst of a storm. The body of Jesus was subject to fatigue. The body of Jesus was subject to hunger. Jesus knew uh, what it was to want food, to be hungry, to look for something to eat. He looked upon a fig tree. Mark 11, 12 says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And when he think of Jesus, didn't always think of him working a miracle. He met his needs. Think of him as being in a human body, subject to limitations, since you and I, uh, Jesus was hungry. Jesus subjected himself not only to childlike obedience, fatigue, and hunger, but he subjected himself to thirst. The body of Jesus knew what it was to crave water. See him as a stranger sitting on the well in the hot noonday time of the day, saying to the woman, listen to this, Men did not do this. Especially Jewish men did not talk with Gentiles. Give me to drink, recorded in John 4, 7. Just that plain, simple statement, give me to drink. Jesus was thirsty. Jesus perspired. Jesus got dizzy. Dusty, excuse me. Jesus walked along the road. He wanted water. He begged for something to drink. Jesus subjected his body to human limitation and also, almost, the last thing he said on the cross was, I thirst. Wow. That body knew fever, pain, suffering, wanted water. It was a human body. See it again. His body was subject to limitation. Jesus' body was subject to the deprivation. Jesus knew what it was to want something that he didn't have because he came in the form of man to walk among men, listen to him. One time he said, the foxes have holes, the birds have air, have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Matthew 8 and 20. Jesus was deprived. He owned no home. Read John 7:53 and 8 and 1. And uh, 8 and 1. And every man went unto his own house. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. When others said, I am going home, Jesus said, I'll go to the garden and pray. I'll go to the mountain and pray. And had no home of his own. The foxes have holes, the birds have the air, have nests. But the, Jesus Christ was subject to all the limitations of the human body, or how I thank God for that.
You know the Bible says he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he sinned not. Hebrews 4.15 The word of God says, For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them who are tempted. Hebrews 2.18 So when you are tempted, remember, Jesus was tempted first. You are thirsty. You are tired. You are hungry. You are deprived. You remember. Jesus as a human body went through all that. So first of all, he subjected himself to the limitations of a human body. Oh, he gave himself in a body. I think of it as so often on the first Sunday of the month when we observe the Lord's Supper, the ordinance of communion. I think of the statement in 1 Corinthians 11.24 where Paul quotes Jesus, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. The words broken is inserted at, and it should read, take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. He said, my body is for you. Jesus took upon himself a body. Why? For you. That was God's way of Christ to be revealed and manifest in a human body subject to all limitations of a human body. He was made in the likeness of man. That was all number one. 26 minutes of number one. The number two is another uh, 26 minutes. It goes into the Old Testament and the New Testament and gives the prediction. Number three became a man that he might subject himself to man's death and the grave. Number four, he became a man that he might subject himself as a man to Adam's curse. That's the body going to the grave. I was talking to Mr. Mr. Malone about a song that I have thought so much of recent days. Just part of it would come to me. The song started like this. I saw one hanging on a tree and agony and blood. He fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. And the choir sings this says, He's looking on you. He's looking on you. Over with love, compassion, love and compassion so true. He's looking on you. He's looking on you. He is looking on you. Another verse of the first song says, A second look he gave which said, I freely all forgive. The blood is for the ransom paid. I died that thou mayest live. What a song that is. Let's thank God that the curse is gone. Let's thank God it's gone. It's removed. It's lifted for those who believe. Yes, he subjected himself to the body of a man that might assume man's curse. And five, he became a man that we might be made in the likeness of God. Isn't that something? Now God brought his likeness to the earth in Jesus Christ. God brought his likeness to the earth in his Son, Jesus Christ. When we see God, will we see him? I don't know that. We will see Jesus. He is the representative of the God that created everything. In essence, the God that created everything became a man through Jesus Christ. And that's the God we see. And that's the God we know. The incarnate Christ. The one who never sinned in human flesh. The only one who ever walked on this earth and did not sin in human flesh. Well, we will see you next time. It's been good to be with you this day. Whatever time of day it is for you. It's the same time of day 
for all of us. We'll see you then. Right. Bye-bye.